Hello friends. We want to just share with you a special message before we dive into this books of the book on the book of Daniel. We're going to be taking it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but we want to encourage you that a lot of what we're going to be studying, a lot of what we're going to be understanding in Bible prophecy, as well as in Christian experience and relationship with God, is going to be very real and very applicable to your life and to the time in which we live. We're seeing events transpire that have been predicted in the book of Daniel. We're entering into an experiences, into trials that are also duplicates of what we see in the book of Daniel. And we want to encourage you to, to view and to encourage others, friends, neighbors to view these programs because we believe that Jesus Christ is coming very soon. And we want you, your friends, your family, your community to, be, community to be ready for that event. So please join us as we view the book of Daniel on Books of the Book. Hello friends, welcome to Books of the Book. We are going to be studying the book of Daniel. My name is James Rafferty. And I'm James's co-host, Ty Gibson. We're happy that you've joined us for the study of the book of Daniel. It's an incredible book that seems to me, James, to run in two basic tracks. On the one hand, in the book of Daniel, you have the storyline of Daniel's life as yes. a captive in Babylon, in a foreign country. And his story unfolds through the book of Daniel. He tells exactly what he's experiencing as a captive in Babylon. And then the second track that runs through the book of Daniel are the prophecies, the visions that are received, one by Nebuchadnezzar, then a second by Nebuchadnezzar, and then Daniel receives visions, and those visions are brought forth throughout the book of Daniel as well. So we have storyline, and then we have prophecies that are revealed in the book of Daniel. And one of the interesting storylines in the book of Daniel is not written by Daniel or about Daniel. It's written by Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. And it's about Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king ruling the world who turns his heart fully to God through the witness of Babylon and through the experiences of these visions and these dreams that we're going to be talking about. Bottom line, what we're going to realize, friends, is that the book of Daniel is not so much about prophecy as it is about relationship. In fact, prophecy in Daniel is not as much sensational as it is relational. Mm. The whole book of Daniel in its prophetic outline is directing us to a relationship with God. The name Daniel, the author of the book, means God will judge or God will vindicate. And we find that throughout the book of Daniel, God is in this process of leading Daniel and others through providential experiences that pan out in judgment, that pan out in over and over again. Daniel, for example, being judged righteous and vindicated through experiences he has with the other wise men of Babylon who are of Babylon, whereas he's a captive in this foreign country. And then we have prophecies in the book of Daniel that highlight and emphasize judgment and mm -hmm. point forward to the end of time when God's people will be vindicated mm -hmm. before their enemies and the enemies of God's people will be judged as well. Absolutely. In fact, that is a theme that runs all the way through the book of Daniel. In fact, it even begins the book of Daniel because what you have at the very beginning of the book of Daniel is a judgment that comes to God's people. In Daniel chapter 1, let's just uh, open our Bibles there. We'd like to invite you to join us. If you have a Bible, open it up and uh, we'll begin right here in Daniel chapter 1, begin with verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. And he besieged it. And the Lord, verse 2 says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So right here, Ty, we have a judgment of sorts. We have the Lord making a decision, a judgment about yeah. His people. And there are reasons for this. Yeah. And He has decided to allow His people to go captive 
into Babylon. Hmm, the key word here is allow. The language here is very interesting. It says the Lord gave Jehoiakim mm -hmm. into his hands, that is, into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. So God is operating here from his vantage point of divine wisdom. He's looking down upon the situation of his people. He sees their whole history. He sees exactly what is necessary in order to arrest their attention, mm -hmm. in order to lead them, guide them back to him to repentance mm -hmm. to come back to the Lord. And it is God's decision, his discernment, that what is best at this point is to give his people over into the hands of their enemy. Sometimes we refer to this as divine providence. Mm -hmm. And even though it's happening here on a massive scale with a whole nation that's given over, it happens on a kind of, I guess we might call it a micro level in our lives. That's where we want to be. Yes, God looks at us. He sees exactly what's going on. He sees the pattern of the decisions that we're making and God makes judgments. He makes decisions mm -hmm. as to what would be best for us as individuals and those that our lives intersect with and God allows certain things to take place that are for our good. And I really like that phrase, that last phrase you used there, Ty, because as you go back in the Bible and you have a number of prophets that predicted this captivity, they predicted this outcome. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Israel and Judah, God's people were actually rebelling against God and they were not really carrying out His will. And, and God's will in this context was not only that they would be a blessed and special people and follow the light that he had given them, but that they would also shower these blessings upon their neighbors yes. and out to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. They were keeping them to themselves and then they were actually uh, turning away from the light and the blessing that God had for them and they were becoming worse than the heathen around them. Yes. So what was God going to do? And, and he was going to allow them to go captive. Why? Well, in Jeremiah chapter 24, God is here predicting the captivity. Isaiah was a predictor of this captivity. Jeremiah lived through the time of this captivity. Mm -hmm. And in verse uh, chapter 24, in verse 5, God speaking of this captivity in the figure of figs, He says, verse 5 of Jeremiah 24, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Mm, for their good. For their good. For their good. Here's the thing. When God in his providence uh, orchestrates what is for our good, what is best by giving us over to our decisions that, that we're making, the whole time we need to understand that God's attitude, his heart, his posture toward us is not merely to lash out and, and to somehow uh, make us suffer. It wasn't his will that his people would suffer at all. It's not his will that we would suffer at all. But God knows that suffering is very educational and sometimes our decisions are moving in a direction where the only way God could possibly get our attention so that things do work out for our good mm -hmm. is to let us eat or experience or, or somehow go through the very things that we ourselves are tending toward by our decisions. I love Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 7, James. It goes very well with the, what you just quoted there from, from Isaiah. In Jeremiah 12, 7, when God is giving his people over into captivity, he voices his heart toward them and he, he uses beautiful language to describe how he feels about these very people mm -hmm. who are rebelling against him that are going into captivity. He says in verse 7 of Jeremiah 12, I have forsaken my house, God mm -hmm. says. I have left my heritage. Now watch this. He says, I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Mm. This is so precious because even though they're in rebellion, God describes his people, his rebellion people as the dearly beloved of my soul. Mm -hmm. That's God's attitude toward us mm -hmm. even when his judgments are adverse judgments that bring us pain. And so what we see here in these two verses is a loving God, a loving Father who is doing what is the best mm -hmm. for us given mm -hmm. our choices or our situation. Right. Now the reason why this is so important I think and what you're trying to say Ty is is that this national giving over, this national judgment happens to us so often on an individual basis. Right. So individually we, uh, we find trials in our lives, we find difficulties, we find circumstances that don't seem good to us and we 
tend to question God, especially mm -hmm. if we're believers. Right. We tend to wonder, why did God let this happen? Even if we're unbelievers, we question, why is God allowing this to happen? Yes. And we don't recognize in that the hand of God, mm -hmm. and that He's working for our good, and that we are His dearly beloved. And when I say dearly beloved, when you say dearly beloved, friends, when we say dearly beloved, we're not talking about believers. We're talking about the principle, God so loved the world yes. that He gave His only begotten Son. Mm -hmm. We are God's dearly beloved. The whole world is God's dearly beloved, and yet it suffers, and it has these trials, and it has these terrible pains that it is going through. And if you would ask, if we would ask Daniel, Daniel, what do you think of God's plan? God's plan, because Daniel was just a young man. He was just yes. a teenager, 15, 16 years of age. What do you think of God's plan? God has decided mm -hmm. that you will be taken from your homeland, you will be made a eunuch, Mm -hmm. And that's what Jeremiah, or excuse me, Isaiah 31 says, that, that the princes will be made eunuchs. You will be made a eunuch mm -hmm. in the kingdom of Babylon. You'll serve a heathen king for the rest of your life. You'll be severed from your family, and you will never have a family. You will never mm -hmm. have kids or grandkids, yeah, ever. Yeah, yeah, Daniel, what do you think of that plan? What do you think of what that plan? What do you think plan? of that plan, uh, What do you think, Daniel? Huh? <laughs> yeah. And Daniel will probably go, well, that doesn't sound like such a great plan. No, no. But if you were to take Daniel all the way through his experience and go to yeah, the very yeah, end of his yeah. life, and at the very end of his life, you were to say, Daniel, what do you think mm -hmm. of your life? Looking back, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, so, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've had read, it any other yeah. way. I've read where an author says that uh, if we were in eternity future mm -hmm. to look back over the entire history of our lives, yes. each of us as individuals, mm -hmm. we will come to the conclusion that we would not choose to be led any other way than we were led. God is mm -hmm. incredibly with infinite wisdom, orchestrating exactly what is best for us in every given situation in this sense, James. He looks upon us and he would rather that we make other choices than we're making oftentimes. Right. But, but God factors in our free will mm -hmm. and factoring in our free will and the choices we're making, God oftentimes reluctantly has to, has to kind of, what is the language in Daniel 1? Give us over mm -hmm. to things he would rather not give us over to, right. things that he would rather we not experience. God mm -hmm. is not in favor of slavery. Mm -hmm. Daniel was made a slave in a foreign land. Mm -hmm. God is anti-slavery. He didn't want Daniel to suffer this fate, but he knew God from his vantage point of divine wisdom. He knew that ultimately a plan was working out that was for their best good that involved God releasing them to the direction of their choices. Yes, and, and we see this as parents, as grandparents. We see choices that mm -hmm. our children, our grandchildren make and that we are, are helpless in a sense held back by their freedom of yes. choice, even though we have some authority over them, some power over mm -hmm. them, some influence over them. But at the same time, we have to allow them to make certain choices. And I yes. like what you said about that author. I was thinking about Paul when you said that in Romans 8.18, for I reckon that the suffering of this present yes. time are not worthy to be compared. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. What is God's purpose in allowing this? Yeah. It's to get us to heaven. It's to get us saved. It is to, and I want to say more than just to heaven saved, it is to save us from our bad choices. Yes. It is to save us from the ultimate result of sin. Yeah, it is, it is precisely because God loves us and regards us as his dearly beloved mm -hmm. that he finds it necessary sometimes to release us to our choices so that so that as we we touch that which is hot mm -hmm. we will be inclined to pull back from it and, and we won't suffer greater loss he actually allows us to make smaller mistakes in yes. order to prevent us from making colossal mistakes that would work our ruin. And this is one of the, the, the added aspects of what God is doing. When we go through these trials, uh, they draw us to God. Mm -hmm. They draw us to reach mm -hmm. out to Him in ways perhaps they never have before. Uh, some might say, well, they drive me away. Well, that's the choice that we can make. And God is seeking to help us yeah. to realize mm -hmm. our need of Him and to be drawn to Him and to reach out to Him and to connect with Him in ways that we haven't before. And that's what we're going to find as we continue to study this powerful book of Daniel. Don't go away, we'll be right back.